do for everyone, but I want everybody, I want if, if I was making a mistake, I want everybody to be accomplished. With me. <laughs> so when I gave him the part, he started crying and his older brother started crying. And I was like, oh, I created a problem here. And they were crying because their, their home was in foreclosure. And this movie saved their home. And the wow. kids were like, so, so that was, so he's not upset then, basically. They were not upset. The, the older brother became the, uh, the standing, so he got a job too. Wow. Ali, what's it like to work with him? I know you guys have both plays, um, and normally I'd say no TV, no, no, no distractions. At the time I needed a distraction to think outside the box, and I found a little TV with an antenna. There was no cable or anything. I picked up one channel. Actually, it was the channel. I don't remember the other channel. But one of the channels was the History Channel. And I kind of picked it up. I just wanted to kind of, and it was Truman talking about the bomb. And, you know, I'm from Mexico. I didn't know the bomb was called Little Boy. And that in itself kind of took my brain into, I literally stayed and little by little, I was like, kid, his nickname is Little Boy. And everything kind of is like a math problem. And I, I was already there for two weeks. And literally within four hours, I had the whole arc of the story. Of course, those two hours took me two years to put on paper. Now, uh, where was this filmed? In Mexico. So this movie, when I finished, they, they budgeted for $60 million. One producer told me, look, the only way to make this movie harder is to shoot it underwater. <laughs> you, know, you have a period movie with a seven-year-old boy, you know, people don't really like this kind of movies anymore. You know, it's completely outdated. So everything was no, 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 no. This movie is about believing in the impossible. So the more he made it more impossible, the more I actually liked it. Because I was like, that's exactly what I wrote. This kid thought that he could end World War II. I think I can make this movie. And at that time, I thought we didn't have no one dollar on the budget. So. We started looking at the options, if we can lower the budget, and if it was impossible to lower the budget in the US. And we started looking around all around the world to see if we can lower it, lower it, lower it. And of course, unfortunately, in Mexico, everything is cheaper. Um, so we decided to budget it. What happens if we build the entire town? What happens if we build everything? And just to, we built the entire town, the streets, telephone poles, even the port where the kids stands. We, build that into the water, you know, I remember when they were building that, it was so dangerous because using major power, electrical power, and at the end, you know, they gave us the budget and says, you know, it cost you this much to build an entire town, and it was like, haunted, you know, it was like incredible, I was like, okay. So we budgeted from 60 to now to 20, and then we went and started traveling all around the country to raise the money, and the story was strong enough that we raised $20 million in it, within eight months. It was at the James Cameron Studios in Rosarito where he shot Titanic. So that's where we were. It's a beautiful studio, but it was absolutely empty because no one wanted to shoot in Mexico. We even had Kevin James, who was under contract with, with Sony. They didn't want to let him even come to shoot. So they would fly him in on the helicopter and fly him back to San Diego. And once he saw, like, the, oh my gosh, this is so ridiculous. I can't believe I'm flying in on the helicopter. It's totally fine. Um, it, it was great. It was very. They were very accommodating. It was. It was a wonderful studio to shoot at. What's the status of the town? Did you tear it down afterwards? Well, Is it still you know, there? Every movie will go over budget. There's not one single movie that doesn't go over budget. And if they tell you they didn't go over budget, they're lying to you. It's 100. percent It's like you know, it's like a contractor. They're like, oh, how much is it going to cost me to redo the kitchen? You know? Yeah. Whatever they tell you, you know, it's, you have to put at least 20, 30 percent over that. But is the is the town that you guys built still there? Yeah. Or? So when we were over budget, we we needed money. So I called the owner of the studio and I made a deal. I say, hey, you know the you have to even measure the deposit, you know? So it was like around $800,000 deposit, and I needed that kind of money to finish the movie. I said, well, can I have my deposit back and you keep the town? <laughs> and he said, deal. So you set out to make said, a movie and you yeah, sell the town. Yeah, <laughs> so I sold the town to him. So he, he has a town in there. <laughs> now he's wow. like, what do I do with this town? Wow. Uh, now, I know you guys have some questions, and I'll head out to you guys here in just a second. When you do, uh, just go ahead and, uh, and, and raise your hands. Uh, 
I, I want to ask you, obviously that there's there's an important message slide here that I think we, we all take away differently. But for you, what do you hope that people take away from this film? Well, many things. One, to not stop believing in the impossible. Something happened to us, you know, when we're kids, we believe. You know, I have three kids, and if, you, if I tell them they can fly, which I don't, they will attempt to fly, which is beautiful, you know. It's uh, every great idea comes from believing you can do it, you know. Uh, I think it was uh, Roosevelt that said, if you believe, you're halfway there. And that's pretty much the power to believe. It takes courage to believe, to dare to believe, and that's what I think is the most important thing. Then when we're from children, we start growing, and when we become adults, we stop believing. We become very, like, we just use a lot of our reason and no more of, you know, believing we can do things. And to me, that's very important because I believe this country, which I love, was built on a believing, believing we can. And then I see a country, which the one I come from, which I love, they don't believe they can, and my country is messed up. And one thing that I see in this country is that that belief, that strength, it's kind of getting lost little by little by little because of the second thing of the movie, which is division, labeling. We started, we have a tendency to label and to divide. It's like, okay, you're red, I'm blue, and let's see how much we disagree about life. Every time somebody tells me, it's like, I believe this, what do you believe? I literally ask, do you like wine? They say, yeah, what kind of wine do you like? And then let's, let's talk about things that we both like. If you don't like wine, let's talk about mezcal, tequila, or any other. Just go on down the bar. <laughs> and if you don't drink, like, we can switch to coffee. Once we figure out what, kind of, what we like. It has to be a liquid for It has to be a liquid, for <laughs> sure. Understood. Uh, I'm going to head on it. If you guys have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. I'll start right over here, sir. Hi, this is uh, Paul and Carol Hill. We live in Canada, but we've met Eduardo several times. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. And um, I must say, this is the second time we've been to the movie and we brought some friends. Um, this is a wonderful movie. And uh, the story is wonderful, but I think that you really did a masterful job, not only in choosing uh, the little boy, but in the way that you orchestrated the direction of the movie. And I compare it with Russell Crowe's uh, movie, which is also a war story, but the first war. And it's also a wonderful story, but he doesn't draw out the emotion like you've been able to do in this movie. This, we just, we saw it the second time. Both of us had tears the second time we saw it. It moved us as much the second time as it did the first time. This movie we're talking about. And Russell Crowe's movie is a great movie, but it doesn't draw the motion like this one does. So I just, I just want to compliment you for doing a fantastic job on this. And please say hello to Eduardo for us when you see him. It's Paul and Carol Hill. Oh, thank you so much. You may see him first before me. He lives in a plane, you know. He's, he's been so kind trying to promote this film, you know. A lot of the times, you know, unfortunately, you know, the, the directors are not as wanted when you promote a movie. So I haven't been able to promote this, but Eduardo has been nonstop all around the nation. He's, a, he's, a, he's the godfather of, of my first, of my daughter. So. Thank you so much for your compliment. Next question over here. Hi, my name is Angie Mellado. And more than, uh, than a question, it's more like uh, saying thank you for this kind of uh, masterpieces that we are able to, to see. Um, we're always, trying to, to be able to like, see these kind of, uh, of movies with really good messages. So me as a Mexican, it's an honor to be in, just look at you here. I mean, in this little town, I never imagined that I was gonna be able to, to, to do this. And I'm really proud of you guys, all of you, Iñárritu, all of you guys. You've been doing such a really, really wonderful job. And Thank you. I just want to tell you that we are always trying to, I'm sorry, I'm really nervous, <laughs> um, to like contribute somehow, some way with your job and just let you know that we are really proud of all of you guys. All of you guys. Sometimes, as you can see, it's, it's not many Mexicans here just me and my daughters. 
but just let you guys know that we are aware of all of your work and we appreciate it so much. And I'm thank really you, proud you. of all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much. much. Thank you. Thank you. But I just want to one, one thing. It's, you know, movies like these, they need a lot of support because, you know, we, we don't, you're not going to see a billboard of Little Boy. I think you barely saw a poster of Little Boy. So my billboards are you guys. If you like the movie, you know, this movie, it's about sizes, big versus small. We all have giants in our lives that we need to defeat. Right now, Little Boy in itself, the movie, it's David, but half the size of David. And Goliath is 10 times bigger than Goliath, and it's called Avengers. So Avengers is coming out today. And we have tomorrow one of the most coveted fights ever. So this weekend is so critical that movies like these get crushed. Um, so the only thing that this movie can survive is word of mouth. So if you like the film, please tell everybody. Just literally go on your social network. If you did not like the film, just, you know, I'm, there's many films you don't like, just put, forget about it. But if you like the movie, tell everybody. It's already on Facebook. Okay, another question. How are you doing? Um, I'm Julie Nunes, my wife Yolanda. Thank you so much for the movie. Um, it was an amazing story as far as how you said you found the, the young boy to play the main character. My wife and I have been watching the, um, the trailers for several weeks just waiting for the movie to come out. And I have to admit, my, both my wife and I, we, every time we saw a little boy in the trailers, we said, that is the cutest little boy that we've ever seen. And for us to just, you know, just we just couldn't uh, wait to see for the movie to come out. I uh, thank you so much for making movies that, for at least um, um, some folks, we just like the message. It's always nice to see messages with hope and faith. And uh, oftentimes, unfortunately, my wife will come to the movies, we'll look on the marquee up and down and go, nope, sorry, <laughs> you know, there's nothing that interests us. So with great anticipation, we came out uh, here to the desert to to watch the film, and we thank you so much for putting together such an awesome film. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm really sorry the crowd is so hostile towards you guys. Uh, I, I have a question. Uh, you, you mentioned, Allie, that your character was was cut quite a bit from the uh, from the film. What was what was the original uh, story arc for your character? Well, I was had a lot more lines. I think he, he, you know, he even cuts his wife out a little bit. <laughs> um, I just, I, my, my role was bigger. My character was bigger. I tell the story of the relationship my husband and I. Um, yes, I'm knitting for the war efforts, but I, I delve deeper into that story and that relationship and how he's gone and we're about to have the baby. Um, so a lot of that was cut. But <laughs> the, my one thing Thanks that I did. The, question. the one that awesome? thing that awesome? I will say this. Look, I, the yeah. one thing I will say is that you know, of course, a film can die in the editing room, right? And I was nine days away from having our second child. With you know, this film was five years of our life. We've had two children during this process. Um, so our three-year-old. I gave birth during the filming. My husband flew in for one day, held the baby, we took the picture and he left again. And then I went back in with the baby about a week or two weeks old and he is in the funeral scene. I'm holding him, um, our newborn. And that was my one thing I said, you can cut whatever you want. You can cut me out the film if you, if you have to, if you're short on time, but do not cut that scene with our little baby. Cause I went all the way to Mexico with a newborn and that is our little boy. So he did not, he honored my wish. <laughs> uh, we have another question. Well, it's a little bit more of a statement. Um, I was enchanted by how the innocence of the child didn't get tarnished. That I can't speak for anyone but myself, but you know, at a certain point in your life, cynicism starts to kind of creep into the pores. And I, it didn't happen. I was absolutely, at the end of the movie, I realized 
that for me, the beauty was the ex total acceptance of that little boy's innocence. And I thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, another question, uh, the, the other kids, they're so mean in the movie. How, how were they to deal with on set? Were they all nice kids or did you go out and cast a bunch of mean kids? No, they were the nicest. Actually, they did not want to be mean. They're like, ah, I don't want to say that to him. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so Please. they were very, very, you know, Freddie is one of the nicest. Actually, Little Boy was a little bit meaner than Freddie. <laughs> so Freddie, the big boy, he was one of the most nicest, gentle souls I've met. He was so nice, and he still is. See, I just saw him in the premiere in, in LA, so it's the opposite. Spe speaking of, uh, of, of mean, uh, there, there's a word thrown around uh, in, the, uh, in the film, I don't even want to say it, but uh, towards one of the characters. Awkward to watch when filming it on the set. Is that awkward, or everybody just takes it professionally? How, did, how does that work when, when dealing with race and, and things like that? Well, you know, Hashimoto, yes. he was, he's born and raised in Japan, and he was in, uh, he was part of, you know, his father was part of the whole World War II, so, you know, the relocation camps, his father went through that, so for him it was very sensitive, but he understood that it was very important to bring brought out and thank me, because he said that very few films really you know, noticed or, or, or put attention to when, you know, the relocation camps happen. And there's one line that he said it with very, very passion when he says, I have the face of the enemy. Yeah. And that is a very dangerous line because, you know, I, I this country has given me everything, everything. I, I Mexico was, it's a tough, when I was being raised in there, making movies in Mexico was like out of the question. That's why most of the Mexican filmmakers move here. Right now, it's a, it's, a, it's a different thing. But I always think that labeling and anything that causes division is very dangerous because what happens if the US goes to war with Mexico? I have the face of the enemy. So for him, it was a very sensitive time, but he understood that it was a movie, but it also was an opportunity to create awareness. So he took it very serious. I just want to thank you for reminding us to never stop dreaming. And I want to thank you for reminding us that love heals. It's fear and hatred that separates us. And, and uh, this is a movie that has wonderful spiritual energy. So thank you for that. Two-part question. How, in this corporate Hollywood environment, do you find the money to keep getting this message out that's so sorely needed? That's number one. And number two, what's your next project? You already know what the next uh, dream that you're gonna dream is. Well, the first question is a great question. It's really difficult. You know, I don't know if you guys, they, 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 the film critics out there are completely, you know, I, I respect critics. I completely respect critics as long as they criticize. But there's a line, there's a line where you can abuse your position. The president of the United States can abuse his position. I, as a director, can abuse my position. Anyone can, parents can abuse their position. Critics, with this movie, I don't know what it happened. And it mainly was, it was because of labeling, but they abused their position. They didn't criticize the movie, they attacked it. And it was very, very interesting because, you know, in the beginning they liked it, for some critics, before it went out to theaters. But then it was, the movie was labeled, and they went berserk. But I personally, when I started reading some of the criticisms, I say, well, they're crossing the line now. They're, they're really attacking the movie. They're not criticizing it. You know, I don't mind. I've, I'm a filmmaker. Of course, I don't expect everybody to like it. I expect critics, critics to come and, you know, they're the experts to be like, oh, this isn't okay. As long as you're professional, I'm professional, let's be professional. The problem is when you cross that line and you start labeling and you start calling people names, and you start calling audiences names, that's when it's very dangerous. If you just gotta look at that period, World War II, they're doing exactly what happened in World War II, all the way from Hitler and labeling all the races. It was, it's very, very dangerous what these guys are doing. And I personally, you know, I, all my agents, I was like, hey, don't go, don't say anything about the critics. I'm like, man, I'm fearless. They already hate me. 
Hey, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna talk. So if you give me a mic, I'm gonna talk. So at the end is this, you make a product, the audience, it's, we broke one record now. It's the biggest movie with such gap in Rotten Tomatoes, if you go today, it's almost a 90, 89 or 90, nice. voted by the audience. Wow. And it's almost 78 point difference. There's no any other movie that is so far out from audiences to a movie. So, we don't, we don't have no idea what happened. Mm -hmm. we, we, we don't listen to critics. I know there's, uh, uh, what's his name, Golden Mayor, uh, he said, don't listen to the critics. Absolutely. Don't even ignore them. Because if you ignore them, that means you, you know they're there. So, I, I, I'm applying that because at the end I make movies for the audience, I don't make movies for 33 people out there. So, you know, if, if I respect them, it's their job, as long as they are respectful, you know, we can, we can be civilized. As long as we're civilized, you know, I, I believe in one thing, let's agree to disagree. And if we, you know, most of my friends don't believe what I believe, and we love each other, we have a friendship just like Hashimoto and Father Oliver, for like 20 years, and from the beginning, you know, even in marriages, you know, when I marry, I say, look, let's get married, but I'm not gonna change, and if I change, it's a plus, and I don't want you to change. And the problem is when we want and we uh, impose a change on people. I like to propose teams, I don't like to impose teams. This is, I don't have the answers, but I have a lot of questions. So this was an honest exploration about a very, you know, popular thing, which is the power of faith. Is faith a real power or is superstition? Well, let's explore it. Let's explore it from the eyes of an eight-year-old boy who's willing to believe. And, you know, many times people will read the script, hey, did little boy move the mountain, yes or no? One day, Monday, I'll say, of course he did. Tuesday, I'll be a little down, he's like, I don't know, it was an earthquake, man. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it leaves it open at the end, and at the end, you know, it says, look, Father Oliver, Father Oliver believed God was responsible for bringing my dad back. Hashimoto believed it was his will to live. Which one is it? It could be both. You know, they don't, like the same thing, you know, it's like, let's find out what we agree to create change. If we have things in common, it's far more. You can find people that you have completely disagreements, but if you say, let's see what we agree, you're gonna find out that you may like the same cars, you may like the same, you know, I, I love, I like good wine. You may like find the same wine and so on. You love your children. Then you start thinking, hey, you know what? Let's, let's make a change and we don't like how things are in our society. And then you start finding out the things that you do agree and then change happen. But if you are debating, change will never happen. And that's the problem, we judge too much. It's like judge less, love more. And that's, that's the goal of my movies. And it's like, let's judge less. And unfortunately I make movies and all I, most of the time I'm just grilled and Attack, but you know, it's part of the it's part of the job. So I'm 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 gonna continue my next film. I went into a little bit, maybe you know I always jump to the other extreme. My next movie it's 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 an exploration of where evil comes from. Does it comes from twisted minds, genetics, DNA, bad fathers, worse mothers? Where's it come from, or does it come from? or an outside source, an intelligence, a force, call it Satan, evil spirits, where does it come from? And it's looked from the point of view of an FBI agent who's an agnostic. So, and it deals with a very, very strong serial killer. So it's a little darker, but it will leave you, it will leave you thinking. I think we have time for two more questions. Uh, we'll get over here next and right here. Uh, with your low budget, uh, how did you get such great actors? The script is the script, and if anybody wanna make movies, it's all about the script. So I, I, I wrote the script, my dream was to, I'm a big fan of Emily Watson and Tom Wilkinson, <laughs> and I knew that they, they care about the script, they don't work for money, they're actors that work for what's on the page. So I sent the script to them, they reacted. Emily said, I liked it, I just don't wanna shoot in Mexico. When I hear that, I say, she said yes. I actually flew on a red eye 
to London. I heard that around 3 p.m. and I was in a red at like midnight flying to London, explaining to her why Mexico was really beautiful <laughs> and it was gonna be fine. And you know, anything she heard in the news is the news. So, and our last question. Hi. Hi, I'm Kay Shackleton, the movie gal. Um, uh, Alejandro, you have such strong beliefs. Uh, where did that come from as far as film inspirations? When you were growing up, what, what really brought you to filmmaking as a career? Um, you know, in the beginning was, I love to tell stories since I was a kid. You know, I, I always play with toys until I was 13, 14 years old, and I would hide it from my friends because, of course, I look, it was not very cool. So, but I didn't know what was that drive. I didn't know anything about movies. And one day I saw a set, I went, they sent me to Austin, Texas to learn English, and I saw a set, and I saw that they were doing the exact same thing what I was doing with toys that we were using actors. <laughs> then I decided to go to, you know, pursue that. But then I saw one movie, and that's why I believe that movies have the power to heal and the power to create and make a difference. It has the power because right now we're talking, you know, we have a conversation, you talk. But when you watch a movie, whoever is making the movie is talking for two hours without interruptions. And every single person that writes, they're sending a message. Most of the times it's a, a dark message. Sometimes it's a, a, an inspirational message. I was in film school and I wanted to make movies for three reasons, because I wanted to be famous, to be rich, and to make what I love. Then I saw one film, Chindler's List. Mm. At the end of Chindler's List, Chindler is crying because he has saved 10,000 Jewish people. And his assistant tells him, why are you crying? Like, you just saved the life of 10,000 people. He says, so I will sell could... my car and save one more. And right there, when I saw the movie, I was like, wow, what am I doing for the world? Nothing. Zero. So right there, I, if something happened to me that it evoked many, many changes. I literally changed my life. That was the beginning, but it changed my life. I changed all of my friends, and I started this company called Metanoia Films, which means a light in the darkness. Instead of complaining about the darkness, let's just turn a little candle. And that's pretty much what we do. That's pretty much the movies that I like to make. It's movies that propose themes that will create meaningful conversations. All I want for me is not to tell you what to think, but to create that you talk about something that is meaningful, that it's important. We spend so much time talking about meaningless stuff. I'm guilty of that. So when I realize, I'm like, oh, this is, we're just wasting time. We're not getting anywhere. You know, we're not politicians. We're not going to change anything. <laughs> Let's just talk about the guy who's outside who's hungry. What about if we help him? You know, at least. That's a real change right there. So that's pretty much the thing. And I know there was no more question, but this guy has been holding his hand from the beginning. I'm glad you saw that. I didn't see that. Thank you very much. Um, a statement and a question. The first question, the first statement is just, it seems like coming out of Mexico, there's a lot of great filmmakers. We could take a look at the Oscars the last two years. You know, the best pictures were from uh, filmmakers from Mexico. It feels like a golden age. And I was just kind of wanted to get your opinion. Um, where are these guys coming from, and what is there a common link? And do you think this is a golden age for filmmakers coming out of Mexico? Uh, I don't think so. I just think that the the, the opportunities that there's always been great filmmakers in Mexico. You know, we had the golden age in the 40s and 50s, and there always been great filmmakers. There's always been a lot of talent. I actually wanted to open a film school in Mexico. I mean, if you go to Oaxaca, you see people that are true artists that can take literally a broom and turn it into a piece of art. The, what is not in Mexico that, that today there is, before there was, it was opportunity. And all those people that had that talent, they didn't pursue it because there was not a chance. So when Iñárritu and Cuarón, and then they started and they started jumping into, you know, they, I was in film school when they were already making, you know, winning cans and making these great films. Mexicans in Mexico realized, you know what, we can do this, not in here, we gotta go over there. So, you know, I was one of them, we moved to the U.S. and film school started opening, and then all of a sudden, Mexico started supporting 
Mexican filmmakers. So the only thing that really changed was the country in itself now is nourishing the new up-and-coming filmmakers. Now there's great film schools in Mexico and there's great support. So you will see a lot of filmmakers coming up, just like in Europe, and it's becoming more of a culture. Like it, it was dead in the, it, it was, we were incredible in the 50s, it was the golden era, and then 60s, 70s went down like, because of politics. Yeah, and, and you know, I think 60% or 65% of my investors were, were from Mexico. 